Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> so, quick introduction. Uh, Louis Hall, founder of Cerulean, back in 1999, in the heady days of dot-com booms and technological revolutions and all the rest of it. Uh, that was a MBO from a company called Logica, which some of you might remember. That was a large UK software house. And essentially, we bought the, the part of Logica that I ran at the time, which was the, the um, customer care and billing division, a part of telecoms. Uh, Oliver Gilchrist joins us in uh, 2001 with a, a, a glowing track record of PwC and uh, technology startups and so on. So what does Trillion do? Very, very simply, we, we build CRM and billing systems for global telcos. So we say systems are mission critical because they're systems which our customers have to have. They can't do without these systems. They enable them to onboard customers to monitor the customers used on their networks, connect those customers to networks, uh, charge those customers for that usage, bill those customers, collect payments, cut them off when they don't pay, restore their services when they do pay, uh, you know, workflow, trouble ticketing, every, every, every sort of core enterprise function you could imagine a telco would have to do. The, these are also sticky relationships. It takes a long time to replace a CRM and billing system. Uh, telcos don't enter that, that journey lightly. It's typically three years, a three-year journey, uh, often longer from deciding you're going to replace your billing system to actually having it done. And obviously huge reputational risk that you get it wrong and you send out bills that are wrong and you've probably all seen stories in the press about those sorts of things happening. Never to us, I hasten to add. Uh, customers are also very important to us because they generate a very large amount of our annual revenue. So 70% at least of our annual revenue is generated by our existing customer base. And that's important because Although not all of that is purely recurring, it is semi-recurring in that you know, customers will always just spend a certain amount of money and that enables us to uh, have a fairly smooth uh, growth line. Moving on. So, a little bit about our product strategy, what we actually, what we actually do. So, we essentially have a core business based on our enterprise software suite and this is by and large the bulk of our, of our, of our business and our income. So that, that's the software I've just been talking about. But we recently developed a pure cloud, cl cloud native solution called Cerulean Skyline. And what that's, what that's attempting to do is to take a thin slice of the functionality in our, in our enterprise platform and provide that across a vast range of verticals. So Skyline, the cloud solution, just does uh, charging and billing. So a, a much smaller subset of functionality. But it does that for any kind of business. So we have customers in digital marketing, in publishing, in uh, healthcare, and so on, uh, who are using the cloud solution to bill those sorts of things. Um, whereas the enterprise product <clears throat> is a you know, business transformation project, it's typically at least nine months, sometimes 18 months, sometimes even as much as two years to implement. Um, these are typically three to five million pound contracts just to start with um, for that implementation. The, 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 the cloud solution is pure SaaS model, so it's pure software as a service. There's no upfront cost. It's a pay-as-you-grow model. Uh, we're talking about implementations in days or weeks, not months and years. So a very, very different model. Uh, and um, the, the, I guess there's two main, there's, there's, there's a couple of main reasons why we've, we've done Skyline and, and gone with the cloud solution. One is obviously we want to boost our, our pure recurring revenue. So for us, recurring revenue is, is, uh, is very important. And of course, all of that revenue is recurring. But also, at some point in the future, although telcos are slow to adopt cloud for their core systems, because obviously telcos have concerns about data security and if my, data is, my customer data is in the cloud, is that really a good thing? Uh, very conservative in that respect. But also telcos require their, their computer systems to be very closely integrated into their networks because all of this stuff is happening in real time mostly. Uh, and that's harder to do if you're working with, with systems in the cloud. Um, but, but even telcos we think will eventually move in this direction. So it's about making sure that we're, we have a solution 
if they decide that enterprise is no longer key. Yes, please. So if, if you've got a much sort of quicker take up time, does that mean you've got a higher level of customer churn as well if people are moving on and off these things? These are inevitably less sticky customers, correct. But it, it's, it's one of those things, again, if, if the billing system's working, you just don't change it. So, so it, yes, it, they're not as sticky, but so far, you know, we've, we've not experienced much in the way of churn. Um, of course, the, the other reason for, for, for doing cloud is to diversify across these different verticals. And you know, we feel that helps to future-proof the business because if telco slows down for whatever reason, then we've got customer bases in healthcare, huge growth market, for example, fantastic. Okay, um, very quick look at the, the product suite. I'm not gonna go and explain these, so don't panic. I won't go through all of these boxes. But suffice to say, this is a large modular suite. We can deliver it pre-integrated with all these blue boxes um, out of the box. And we do that for lots of our customers. For some customers, we might only supply one or two of these boxes, and th these are, um, they work with um, enterprise software, buses and APIs and so on. So these can be integrated into uh, our customers' other systems very easily. Um, so typically network inventory, for example, which is a standalone module in its own right, we supply to some customers and nothing else, uh, and so on. The, the only other point about this particular slide is that the, the, the big boxes at the back, the multicolored boxes, are the telecom industry's model of what you need to have in a billing, a billing and CRM system. And the blue boxes, as you can see, cover pretty much all of those areas. So the point is that we have a very broad, uh, broad footprint of functionality. Uh, so what's our strategy? Good question. So for us, it's all about taking what we have, which is a very solid enterprise software business, but an established customer base, and ramping that up. So how do we grow that faster? And obviously the key to long-term shareholder value is faster growth, et cetera, et cetera. So on the enterprise side, we recently introduced a, what we call a convergent charging system. And this is a brand new real-time charging platform. And without getting into too much telco jargon, this enables us to bill any kind of telecoms event, whether it's TV, broadband, internet, uh, mobile, fixed wire, whatever it is, in real time on the same platform. And in the telco world, that's a very important commodity. So being able to be able to converge your services onto a single charging platform means you can do all kinds of clever things in cost subsidizing between different services. So for example, uh, yeah, um, Sky Television, Sky Broadband, Sky Mobile, and so on. Those packages are all very simple to present on TV, but to actually engineer them in the background is very difficult. And that's where this platform comes in. So, so the CCS real-time charging platform has really been at the forefront of most of our wins in enterprise over the last couple of years. So particularly in mobile. So for mobile data, where all the growth is in telco revenues, that's a big, that's a big part of the piece. Uh, on the right-hand side, we, we've spoken about Skyline, about the cloud solution. And this is opening up new markets for us, not just in software as a service, but in other verticals. And, of course, the, the, the third prong in terms of growth, if you like, is that we're also looking to grow um, <clears throat> inorganically through acquisition. And one of the main reasons we went to AIM two years ago was to have a platform that we could use to raise capital easily to go and buy other companies and expand in, in that direction. Um, in terms of where we are geographically, we're headquarters in London. Uh, about half our staff are in Pune in India. Uh, that's an operation we started 10 years ago. These are all our own people. We built this from the ground up. Uh, and they do uh, a lot of support, R&D, software development, that sort of thing. Uh, and we also have small offices in Sydney and Miami. So those are more regional sales, customer support functions, supporting Asia Pacific and the Americas, uh, respectively. So a very quick look at why, why, do, why do telcos need to change their billing systems? If it's, so the obvious question is, if it's hard to change these systems and high risk and nobody likes doing it, why, why would you bother? And of course, these are the reasons why you might want to do that. Telecoms has been an industry where telephone companies are driven by technology. 
say, there's 3G, we need 3G. There's 4G, we need 4G. There's 5G. And, and often telcos will invest in these technologies and not really understand why, what, what, what the business model is in terms of how do I make any money out of that. So in order to make money out of those new technologies, one needs to create new services. And to do that, you need support systems like CRM and billing. So the, that's a key driver often in projects we win to replace billing systems. The old system isn't flexible enough to support the new technology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> uh, also, um, what you'll find in telcos is that they might have 30 or 40 different billing systems. Because over the years, they've added services. It's easier to just have a new billing system rather than try and upgrade the existing one. The IT department's too complicated, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so often, uh, consolidating multiple systems onto one platform, which our software is very suited to, is a reason for replacing platforms. I mean, it's simple mathematics. If you've got 10 billing systems and you can reduce that even to five, you've saved five lots of maintenance contracts, five lots of internal teams, and so on and so on. Also, technology itself is a driver. So, so sometimes a new technology uh, paradigm is just not supported by legacy billing systems. And actually what, what tends to happen is that new technology just of itself drives change in, in the supporting systems around, around the network. So <coughs> if you're upgrading to 5G for mobile, for example, and you're going to spend the 100 million, well, you might as well change out the integrated billing system and charging system and CRM and workflow around that because you know, we might as well spend the, do that as one big thing rather than wait and let your other systems go out of date and so on. So often for no particular reason, no particular you know, concrete need, um, telcos will upgrade their billing systems because of network technology change. Okay, so a little bit about customer base. Our customers are roughly, typically half our revenue comes from our European customers. Um, and I think the only other point to make about this slide is that this is a very broad range of customers. So we have customers across every kind of telco you can imagine. Um, we have big ones and small ones. Some names we recognize, uh, three probably, uh, Airtel, um, Liberty Global, which is uh, third largest uh, cable operator in the world, uh, and so on. Uh, but we, I think the important point here is that we can operate in niches in the, in the tier one players. Um, we don't necessarily, don't necessarily do the whole thing. And in the mid-sized telcos, we tend to have more of the, the share of the footprint. So it, with our modular product strategy, we're able to play across the tiers, which is important in, in the kind of business that we're in. Um, this picture really just illustrates how we managed to keep the, the growth curve relatively smooth. So as I was saying before, over 70% of our revenue will come from our existing customer base. So in a year where we don't have a particularly huge amount of, new, of revenue from new customers, so the black stuff at the top is revenue coming from customers while well in the current year, we simply expand the amount of work we do for our existing customer base. And we have the ability to turn that tap on or off to an extent, because with 81 customers, you, know, you, you do have that, that sort of constant pent-up demand. Um, so that's important to us. In fact, in the first half, so the numbers are out for our first half of this year, this number was 81%. Um, a very quick look at the, the breakdown of revenue across licensed services, uh, third party and so on. A question we often get asked, so, so these are the numbers. Uh, we had a particularly high software contribution in financial 17. That's the year to September 17, by the way, the last full year we reported. This, in, in, the in our first half of 18, which we've just reported on, this was down to the normal sort of range of 30 to 40 percent. So it was about 34 percent in the first half. That's what we normally expect our software revenue level to be. And, and the fact that we have quite a large amount of services is just a you know, direct result of doing these large transformation projects and doing a lot of work for existing, existing customers. A little look at uh, pipeline. Um, I won't go into this in detail. The important point here is that these are relatively large numbers compared to our revenue, uh, compared to the, the market expectation of our, of our um, turnover for this year. So <coughs> we, you know, we, we can get, get some confidence from the fact that those numbers are in the, of the right order, shall we say. 
Sales pipelines obviously aren't an exact science, as I'm sure you all know. Um, but we do have a very structured process of qualifying leads and taking them through different stages and on a weekly basis, uh, reanalyzing probability. So at any point in time, we know you know, what the weighted pipeline is worth, so to speak. Um, okay, just a very quick look at uh, <coughs> order book and backlog. Uh, very strong order growth going to the end of 17. This is our, our backlog. So this is support and maintenance recurring revenue that automatically rolls over. And this is you know, work contracted but not yet delivered. So that gave us a, a £13 million backlog at the start of 18. Um, at the half year, that had gone up to 15 point something rather. So record back, record back order at the end of our half year. Um, and that gives us a certain amount of comfort in terms of being confident about delivering on the market forecasts that are out there. Um, and, and then some, some recent wins. Uh, Proximus is like the BT of Belgium. So we're in the middle of implementing a, a new system for their, one of their MBNOs. MBNOs are kind of... Um, brands, if you like, a bit like uh, Virgin Mobile in the UK, for example. Um, Eni is, is one of the largest uh, electricity companies in Denmark. They have a fibre network around uh, their territory, and they're now selling wholesale space on that, capacity on that network to service providers, and they're using Cerulean for that, so that's quite interesting crossover with utilities. Um, sure are the the rump of cable and wireless that wasn't sold to Liberty Global a couple of years ago. So they're the telco in, the, the sort of full service telco in Guernsey, Jersey, Isle of Man. So that's quite interesting. And that's an example of consolidating lots of billing systems onto one platform. So that's four or five different systems all being brought together on, in, onto one Cerulean platform. Huge cost savings. Um, and, then, and then this is interesting. I mean, it won't go to more, but ResMed, anyone heard of ResMed? It's the, the world leader in assisted breathing devices. So if you have um, something like sleep apnea, you know, where you, 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 lose, you stop breathing when you're sleeping or your breath, your, your breathing declines when you're sleeping and you have to sleep with a, a breathing mask, um, they're, they're the world leader in, in those. And they're selling this now as a subscription service and they're using Cerulean cloud solution, cloud billing, this went live in a couple of weeks, to sell that service. Uh, right, so, so we've now got some numbers. Um, Oliver, do you want to take us through this? Yeah. Um, this is the uh, full year to September, so this is actually quite historical now. Um, we have actually issued some uh, half-year numbers since then to March 18, but it's effectively um, sort of on track and, and showing the same, same sort of upward projection. Uh, these really in a nutshell, without going through the detailed P&L balance sheet, etc., are our sort of key, uh, key uh, sort of KPIs, which we, uh, we monitor. New orders um, coming in the front door, so revenue to burn in the future, that was up, so that's encouraging. The back order, which Louis has already alluded to, 13.1 million, so just to reiterate uh, the difference between uh, sales and, and, and revenue, um, that is... Uh, Revenue we can take to the PL account in the future. That's a key one uh, for us to, to, to look at. So it sort of underpins the certainty of next year's revenue while we're investing on the, on the, on the cost side. That's at 13.1 million. We have published the number for the half year at March. Uh, so that was up again up to 15.4 million pounds um, as at March for future revenue over the next um, sort of 12 months or so. Uh, total revenue moving on to the PL account 16 million. Uh, up from 14.8. There's a breakdown um, between key components, software services and other. Uh, in terms of that, recurring revenue rising to 4.4 million and we're looking for that to further rise going forwards um, with uh, the Skyline product uh, developing going forwards uh, and, and managed service, which a number of, of our customers are moving over to. Healthy EBITs are at 3.6 million. The EBITs are margin. We're looking to achieve at least 20%. We've achieved that over the last few years, um, predominantly by developing India, which is our own subsidiary, uh, and using those staff. Uh, Louis was mentioning they're doing support, R&D, and development work. They're actually delivering end-to-end uh, -end pro uh, projects, customer-facing now as well. Uh, so that's very encouraging. We're up to 100 staff out there uh, now. Um, down the bottom, the key ones are 
We do pay a dividend, um, which is important to investors. At year end, we've got net cash of 1.6 million. During the IPO process, we raised uh, 10 million on the IPO and took a five million pound loan out from HSBC, so 15 million pounds in total. The loan is being repaid over five years with two fifths of the way through it, so down to about three million now. Cash in the bank uh, then was net, taking into account the loan as well, at 1.6 million at, um, at year end, and that's risen since. Um, so we're cash generative and paying a dividend and getting rid of the loan, and we've got growth on top line revenue and we're profitable. Those are, those are the, key, uh, uh, the key items. Tim. Um, yes, margins on services and any plans to migrate the, the mix more from services to software? Sorry, margin on the services? On the services, yeah. What kind of gross margin do you make on services? We, we don't, we don't act, disclose the gross margin on, on specific areas, but our, our gross margin overall is what? Um, 70, 70%. Yeah. Overall. Um, gross margin on license is obviously higher uh, because the, the, the software development costs are sunk costs and so on. Um, but it, it, we, we're selling high end services, so, so we're not selling bodies off the street. Um, these are people who are experts in our software, so they're quite unique in that respect. And we achieve a pretty high charge out rate for those, those people. We're certainly not sen selling people at offshore charge out rates. And, and just sort of in summary, uh, we're established, been here a long time, uh, and we're looking for ways to accelerate the growth of the business, uh, but it's a pretty solid platform. The, the visionary ranking in Gartner, hugely important to us uh, last year, and, and again renewed this year. Uh, as an aside, we're also ranked first in a survey of 100 billing billing company, custom, billing vendor customers uh, based on customer satisfactions. So that was a, a big plus for us. Um, we continue to see traction both in enterprise and, and uh, software as a service with Skyline. Um, and I think as Oliver mentioned, we, we, we do have a progressive dividend policy. Our dividend was up 8% um, year on year at full year and at the half year it was up by? Uh, another 7 Another 7%. So continuously increasing dividend, looking to pay out third to a half for free cash flow. Um, and you know, looking forward looks very positive. So any questions before we get thrown out? Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about acquisitions. Can you just give some, a picture Good about question. what you're looking yeah. for? Yeah, so we're, we're, what, we're, what we're focused on with acquisitions is finding companies that do things around the edge of our, of our footprint. So if you go back to the, um, the picture of our Functional footwork, there we go. <clears throat> so we're not looking to find companies that do this stuff uh, and just duplicate existing functionality. And I think the reason for that is that we've seen lots of businesses fail in the past trying to consolidate platforms and it never really works. Um, so we're looking for things we can fit around the edges that, you know, stretch this one out, sorry, not this one, stretch this one out a little bit maybe. So data analytics is a, is a good example. Um, we'll stretch this one out a bit things that slot in around the sides or in between, um, where we can use the same sales people to, to market those products, and we can sell some of those new products to existing customers and vice versa. So that's very much what the strategy is based around. What percentage of your revenue is coming from non-telco? Non-telco. Um, we, we, we have, so we have some enterprise customers on, who, who we, in um, you know, gas, power, water, but we, we don't disclose that, but it, 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 it's relatively small. It's less than 5%. But it will become much bigger. Yeah, it's, great. it's growing fast. Yeah, yeah. It, it will be much bigger in the future. Guys, I'm, we're going to wrap it up there, but if we could all just put our hands together. Thank you. Thank you.